All right, welcome everybody. Um, really glad folks could join us. Um, I, uh, I'm grateful uh, for everybody who is able to attend today's COVID-19 vaccine accessibility webinar. Um, we'll be uh, hopefully giving you the kind of information that you need in order to better understand the COVID-19 vaccination uh, issue and process for people with autism. Uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of housekeeping here to get started. Um, so uh, we'll be recording the webinar today and we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel this week. And you'll also get a follow up email with a link to the recording in case you missed anything or in case you want to share it. Um, we will uh, encourage you to use some of the accessibility features in Zoom today, including closed captioning if you prefer. Um, text and there's also automatic translations available on the recording in several languages. So please, again, take advantage of that if, if it suits you. Uh, throughout our talk today, I'm asking that you please submit our questions, any questions that you have um, about the COVID-19 vaccine and accessing the vaccine using our Q&A feature. You can click on that icon in your Zoom controls and submit a question to any of the panelists and we'll answer all the questions there that we can. And uh, we're also gonna ask our panelists to comment at the end during our Q&A portion. For any personal questions or guidance, you can always reach out to the Autism Response Team by email, phone, or chat. Um, uh, obviously, help at autismspeaks.org, one 888 autism 2 uh, we also um, have the chat function available. Uh, so let's get started. And I'm going to start off by welcoming our speakers this afternoon, uh, our panelists. So I'm Dr. Thomas Frazier, the Chief Science Officer at Autism Speaks. I'll be the moderator for today's session. We also have Dr. Marshallin Jurgen Alsop, who is the Medical Officer of the Division of Human Development and Disability at the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We're very, very lucky to have Dr. Jurgen Alsop join us today. Dr. Arun Karpur is our Director of Data Science and Evaluation Research at Autism Speaks. He'll also be giving us some of his insights, the things that he's learned that can help people to better understand the vaccination process. Uh, and Christopher Banks, who is President and CEO of the Autism Society of America. Again, we're very, very lucky to have uh, Christopher, join us and for the Autism Society to be a part of this. And Dr. Alicia Halliday, who's the Chief Science Officer at the Autism Science Foundation and uh, is also going to be a part of our web webinar here and who is um, very well versed in, in the autism space. Um, and finally, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, Ariana Esposito. Ariana is a Director of our Services and Supports Division at Autism Speaks. She's kind of a jack of all trades. Uh, in this case, she's stepping in to talk a little bit about some of our um, resources. So uh, getting started here, uh, I just want to uh, hand it off uh, to, to Dr. Arun Karpur, who's going to help us to understand uh, the importance of the COVID-19 vaccine for the autism community. Dr. Karpur. Uh, th thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Fraser. So uh, uh, I'd like to share a, a little bit of what we learned about the experiences of uh, people with autism spectrum disorders uh, in COVID-19. We conducted an, an, an analysis of a private insurance claim database to understand to what extent COVID-19 impacted uh, uh, our, our community. And we could see from our analysis that people uh, with uh, autism spectrum disorders and those with intellectual disabilities were nine times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID-19 infection compared to individuals without any chronic conditions. Uh, we also observed that people with autism spectrum disorders and intellectual disabilities were six times more likely to have uh, a longer than average length of stay in the hospital. Uh, and uh, uh, people with autism spectrum disorders and intellectual disabilities had third highest median charges among the hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Uh, all of this goes to say that COVID-19 is a, a real threat to our community's well-being 
and it's impacting our community as we uh, uh, as we experience uh, the pandemic uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, 16 to 18 months now. Next slide, please. So when we learned about uh, the impact of COVID-19 and its experience in our community, we went out to ask questions regarding uh, the opinions about vaccines in our community. So we surveyed and we conducted this survey prior to uh, the emergency use authorization that was, that was provided for vaccines uh, for the age groups of uh, children between 12 and 17. Uh, and we did this in March and uh, April of, uh, of this year. Uh, we had responses, uh, respondents from about 48 uh, states representing about 1600 participants uh, uh, or individuals with autism spectrum disorders. So a broad picture of what we found, uh, we found that a little over 50% were not uh, hesitant for vaccines. That means they said that they were very likely or likely to get vaccines almost about 47% of the respondents said that they were hesitant. That means they were not sure or very unlikely or unlikely to get COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, and this question was in specifically regards to children with autism spectrum disorders. Next slide, please. So when we think about the distribution of what we call as vaccine hesitancy, it varied uh, and it was in a predictable direction where where large proportion of low income and minority populations were uh, having high level of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, but we asked the question to everyone saying, uh, why are you, uh, what are the causes? What are the reasons for you being hesitant to, for COVID-19 vaccines? For most part, people indicated that there isn't reliable information available on vaccines, uh, especially for those with underlying health conditions. Uh, the respondents were unsure about the safety and efficacy of vaccines for children with autism spectrum disorders and other health care, other health conditions. Next slide, please. Then we also asked as to what would convince one to be able to change their opinion about whether they will take vaccine uh, for, uh, for their children or not. Uh, well, first, uh, first and foremost, may, many people indicated that when more safety data becomes available for vaccines for children, that they'd be more open in vaccinating uh, their uh, children on, uh, on the spectrum. Um, a, a second large uh, group of in, uh, parents indicated that if their pediatricians were to recommend it, that they would be open taking it since uh, they, uh, they see their pediatrician for more often than not uh, for the healthcare conditions that they would be open to their advice. Um, again, some people said that they, if it is required for travel or for school and other gatherings, they would take it. Uh, and, and then others indicated that when more children in our community get it, we will also be open to taking it. So these are some of the things that we've learned uh, that the COVID-19 is uh, impacting our community in, um, in, a large, in a large way and that the vaccine hesitancy is high in our community of individuals with autism spectrum disorders and that uh, there are available solutions in terms of improving access to meaningful and valuable information that would help people make choices that are uh, beneficial to their, uh, their health. Thanks, Arun, that was really great. I think, you know, not just the impacts of COVID-19, but also you, you sort of touched on the hesitancy piece and how we can help people with that. I think that's really crucial. I think your last point about getting comfortable uh, with and knowing that other people are, are have been vaccinated is a really key one, especially if you're someone who, you know, would benefit from accommodation. So I, I, I think, you know, those are fantastic information. And, um, you know, we're really fortunate to have some stories from our community also that can sort of share their experience about getting the vaccine and what made it successful for them. So one of our first uh, stories here is uh, we, we received some written comments from Chloe, who is an autistic adult who gave her permission to read her comments here. So Chloe said, in my state of Ohio, people with disabilities fell in category 1B or 1C. So I was vaccinated in February. A caregiver was able to go with me to get my COVID vaccine. Everyone there was very nice. 
that was helpful. Uh, getting my vaccine early on was beneficial as it made, it made me feel safer. And I can just tell you as somebody who lives in Ohio and who has a 17 year old son with autism, he had a very similar experience to Chloe as well. So uh, I think her, her experience is great to hear and also representative. We're also uh, joined by a parent, Angela, who, uh, whose child was recently vaccinated and is gonna share more about that. Angela? Yeah, thanks, Tom. So as Tom mentioned, my name's Angela and I live in Virginia. I have two children with autism. Um, my eldest is 15, my youngest is 11. And um, my 15 year old has a couple co-occurring conditions um, that really put him at a much higher risk for serious um, complications from COVID if he were to get it. And also he has level three autism, which means he has some pretty high support needs and he receives a lot of services and um, um, supports from community-based activities and things like that. And so the disruption caused by those services being um, unavailable for him because he wasn't vaccinated was very significant in his daily life. And also it ended up having some pretty negative health impacts. So getting the vaccine was very important for me and for my son. And as soon as he, as soon as they authorized um, the Pfizer vaccine for children under 16, I signed him up. And I live in Virginia and our Department of Health um, created a website that I could go through to sign him up. And in that website, it had some questions that asked about accommodations needs and support needs that he would need at the vaccine site. We went to a mass vaccination site in our county right around the corner and it was um, staffed by people who had actually utilized the Autism Speaks Vaccine Experience Toolkit, which I accessed before we went. And that toolkit walked me through a couple of key preparatory activities. We did a social story. We talked with Isaiah about what was going to happen. We um, looked at pictures of you know, what the vaccine was and how everything would happen, including going into the building, waiting in line, waiting for our shot, getting our shot, and then waiting for the time until we were able to leave. Um, you know, with my son, things like waiting for a long amount of time and um, dealing with sort of unknown situations can really be challenging for him. So those supports were really key into making the experience really positive. And um, like others had mentioned, other stories Tom had mentioned, I was able to go with our ABA therapist who provided support when we went to the facility, their staff had the Autism Speaks toolkit right on the front door. So that really helped reduce my anxiety. And then we were able to get guided through the process up to the front line. And as soon as we got to the front line, my son announced that he needed to go to the bathroom and there were signs all over the place, like don't deviate from the, the wait, you stay in line, you can't access the bathroom. But the staff who had been trained and were sort of sensory aware understood and they walked us right to the bathroom and as soon as we came out I was worried that we were going to have to go to the end of the line and they said no walk right this way they took us to kind of like a VIP area which was separate from the main hall and it was just separated by curtains they had special sort of lounge chairs that were available to sit and make it a more relaxing experience but my son ended up on the floor sitting down and um, the staff were just totally accommodating and supporting and they um um, when it was time to get the shot, Isaiah decided we were going to pretend like it was um, we were firing missiles. And so they counted down with him and said, ready, aim, fire. And he took his shot. And then we waited and played on the iPhone. And afterwards, we, um, you know, the toolkit suggested we have a reinforcement activity. And so afterwards, we went and we got a slushy and we were very excited. And, um, you know, so I think all in all, all of the supports and information that was available in that toolkit really helped. And I, um, you know, I had a lot of anxiety going into it, but I think it was a wonderful experience. And it was so important that I get that protection for my son. So I'm very grateful to have that. And I encourage everyone to get their child vaccinated as well. Thanks a lot, Angela. It's a really, really 
compelling story there and example really of how it can be done in, in a way that is really the best that can be given the circumstances for you and, and for your son Isaiah. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, for anyone in the audience uh, who had a helpful accommodation and would like to share, or if you have a question about accommodations or accessibility, please submit it using uh, the Q&A and we'll post that for other people to see. Uh, to learn more about the tools that are available for the autism community, we'll first go to Dr. Jurgen Alsop from the CDC's National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. Uh, Dr. Jurgen Alsop, please take it away. Thank you very much. I'm gonna do an overview of CDC tools available for people with disabilities and the organizations and individuals who support them. Next slide, please. The toolkit for people with disabilities is often referred to as the disability toolkit. This is what the page for the toolkit looks like. The toolkit is a comprehensive resource for guidance and tools to help people with disabilities and those who care for them make, dis make decisions, um, protect their health, and communicate with their community. Examples of groups that the resource contain information for include direct service providers, people in congregate settings such as group homes, teachers and staff in schools, health department personnel, and individuals with service and therapy animals. The next slide shows how to access the toolkit. You go to the www.cdc.gov, the main CDC website, search toolkit for people with disabilities and click on toolkit for people with disabilities. This is an outline of the categories of information and resources you will find in the toolkit. It includes COVID-19 vaccine resources, guidance and planning documents, web resources, frequently asked questions, a household checklist, posters and fact sheets, social media and videos, and public service announcements. I will discuss just a few of these in further detail in the slides that follow. Next slide, please. First are important considerations for ensuring equitable COVID-19 vaccine access for older adults and people with disabilities. This lists information about how to work with partners to identify persons who need information and offer information on vaccine clinic accessibility and information for homebound persons and people in rural and remote settings. Vaccine considerations for people with disabilities offers information about getting a COVID-19 vaccine, when to get the vaccine, what to expect after vaccination and how to access materials on the virus. Vaccinating homebound persons provides guidance that reviews the challenges regarding vaccinating people who need the help of another person or medical equipment to leave their home or people whose health or illness could get worse if they leave their home. COVID-19 vaccines for older adults has specific information for the older adult population. Next slide, please. Under more vaccine resources, you will find general information about COVID-19 vaccines that help everyone, including people with disabilities and their caregivers learn more about the vaccine. Next slide. You will also find a number of fact sheets that are ready for you to print and share a simple fact sheet about COVID-19 vaccines, strategies from listening sessions with jurisdictions for reaching populations with limited access, basic considerations for how to prioritize and schedule people with disabilities and their caregivers, and a new one pager for direct support providers about why vaccination is important what they can do if they have questions or concerns about vaccination or how they can help someone promote vaccination among their peers. Next slide, please. 
Last but not least, I'd like to highlight some newer resources that support expanded accessibility. You will find a link to easy to read resources for populations with extremely low literacy, including the social story and poster linked to on this slide, as well as a series of videos in American Sign Language. Next slide. We hope these resources are useful and would be grateful to have any feedback you or your partners might have about them. Please also let us know what other needs you may have. We thank you in advance for using and promoting these resources with your constituents, your colleagues, partners, and friends. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jurgen Alsop. That's fantastic. It's really, really great to simply see how people can access and use the CDC toolkits and the guidance that you're providing. That's great for our community. Um, up next is our Autism Speaks Services and Support team. This is the team that creates tools and resources for autistic people across the lifespan. And uh, Ariana Esposito, our director, is going to walk us through some of those resources and toolkits. Ariana, take it away. Thanks, Tom. So um, like Angela had mentioned just a little bit ago, we, we've collaborated um, with a um, Ash Britt who funded supporting the development and the delivery of our Autism Speaks Autism Friendly Vaccine Experience Toolkit, which is a set of educational materials that are appropriate for customer facing and operational staff to use at any COVID vaccination site across the United States and the tools um, for people with autism and those that support them. As part of our Autism Friendly Vaccine Toolkit, um, it was developed by and for autistic people. We have it available in English and Spanish, and there are four main components. This was designed to help vaccine sites create an inclusive experience for people with autism and other related conditions who may need supports to feel comfortable during their vaccine experience. First, the first component is a staff guide for vaccine sites to welcome people with autism. Simple things um, such as allowing breaks or providing um, information on where to go for quiet spaces or other accommodations that are available on the site. The second one is four things that you can do for people with autism tip sheet. This was designed to help um, frontline staff provide inclusive and um, accepting customer service while um, individuals with autism and their families were going through um, the line to get their vaccine. Next, uh, getting a COVID vaccine for autistics and family members. This is a guide that really helps prepare the individual and their family or um, trusted person that's going with them to get the vaccine on what to expect. It can be, as we know, a really anxiety provoking experience um, and it's not always a clear and easy to navigate experience. Um, and so we um, developed this tool to help prepare ahead of time. And lastly, an individual and family supports card. Um, this, this, was, this came from one of our autistic colleagues who helped develop um, all of these tools um, from her personal experience of getting the vaccine and wanting something that's really easy um, to navigate and be able to communicate with the person who um, is delivering the vaccine. And so this, um, you can put the supports that you need. It's visual, it's very easy to understand. And the goal is that, um, you know, it uses universal design for learning principles. So it's very, um, it works for a variety of different um, ability levels. And lastly, um, if you're interested in seeing this toolkit and downloading it, you can find it at autismspeaks.org slash toolkit. Thanks, Ariana. That's great. Uh, a lot of great resources there. Um, we're going to transition now. The, the, the Autism Society of America has also been working really closely with their constituents and stakeholders in the autism community to respond to the pandemic and to make information much more accessible and useful. And uh, Chris Banks is with us today to share more about their work. Chris, thanks for joining us.
Thank you for having me, Dr. Frazier. Appreciate it. Uh, we're delighted to be here. You know, I think what's most important about what's happening today is we continue to de demonstrate the collaboration of all of the autism organizations. Um, you know, the, the, that the Autism Speaks would invite me to be a part of it uh, a second time is something we're very grateful for. So thank you for that. Um, I'm grateful for the the sharing of the resources that we all have been sharing because it's more important for us to get the material out than to lay claim for whose is it, if you will. And uh, I think that's been an important part of it. And you know, we did that when we first came out with a, uh, a, a statement about the need to get vaccinated in December. And we were able to get national organizations, including Autism Speaks, the uh, Autistic Self-Advocate Network, the National Council of Severe Autism, National Association of Autism and a variety of others in the developmental disability space to co-sign that. Um, and then again, we repeated that this spring when documentation came out from the CDC about uh, uh, making vaccines available to those in the 12 to 17. And I promise you that we will continue to do that. We're going to, uh, when CDC puts more information out about vaccines uh, that are established for those under the age of 12, we'll continue to put that out. And I'm certain that we'll have equally amount of uh, collaboration from a variety of organizations for that. No, we're going to continue to have education with the social stories that we've seen already. And we too are very proud of the toolkit we have at the Autism Society. The link is on the page and uh, you'll see many of those resources associated with mental health, education, social stories, public policy, lifestyle supports, um, including Spanish resources uh, in a variety of different places. What's one of our needs as we look at vaccine hesitancy and encouraging vaccines is to have more bilingual material, not just in Spanish, but in other uh, languages uh, available. And I think that's one of the challenges for the autism community as a whole. Um, there are no ba barriers for autism, so we shouldn't have barriers in information um, uh, for those communities. And I think, I think we, uh, we all want for it. You know, the, the toolkits are real important as uh, Angela did a great job of explaining what that is like for her son, Isaiah. You know, we, we need to continue to do that. We've worked with Jefferson Medical Center. Uh, Asan has some great resources as well. And I think we have to continue to promote those. Um, you know, I, I, Dr. Frazier, I would want to mention that, you know, as we look at this hesitancy, we're continuing to seek out stories of teenagers and their experiences so that we can encourage others. You know, you, you have a 17 year old son in Ohio, he can demonstrate for others what that's like uh, better than you and I can, right? We're the dads and, and, you know, we're just beating them up to do it kind of thing. But uh, I think uh, that peer support, not peer pressure, but peer support for doing that is real important. And because of our unique dynamic of 74 affiliates across 39 states, we have the ability to try and reach that into different populations, right? You know, a young person in Oklahoma will listen differently to somebody from that part of the region than perhaps New York, right? And, and I'm just picking that because I'm a New Yorker as well, not, not making fun of anybody. But I think that's an important part and an opportunity that the Autism Society of America and our affiliates have is to try and pro provide that breadth of experience. I think that we're continuing to look at what uh, our advocacy work will do um, as we continue to work on major relief packages along with many of the disability uh, advocates, including Stuart at your organization and, and, um, and Angela at your organization working with Kim, Kim Mushino and others. Uh, we have to continue to work on advocating for the HBSC to include the infrastructure package as part of the American jobs and American families. Now, what's that got to do with the vaccine? It's all about making sure that, there, that those who are in, in the position to make a decision are thinking about the autism community as, as an entity that needs to be focused upon. And, and not just, well, oh, it's everybody. Well, yeah, but we need to make sure we have that special entree. Just just like Angela talked about, you know, that those folks took the time to make sure that Isaiah felt comfortable. That's so important, right? That's so important. And, and we have to do that. You know, we do uh, encourage people to follow us on social media through Facebook and Twitter. Our Twitter handles are at Autism Society and Ignite for Autism. Uh, and lastly, I'll say that we're going to continue our Facebook Live series. You know, we have had 40 plus episodes just around COVID. Um, more than a quarter million people have viewed those. So we know what's happening. And here's the neat thing about it, Dr. Frazier. 
it's going worldwide. You know, we're getting comments from around the world about how do we do this? What do we do? And again, that's what's most important for our organizations when it comes to this pandemic is what are we doing to reach the autism community wherever the autism community is? Um, and that's what I think is most important for our organizations as we continue to collaborate. And I just wanna thank you for giving me the chance to be a part of this. Awesome, thanks, thanks, Chris, that's really great. And, and you know, thank you, but also the, the whole Autism Society of America for all the work that you're doing during COVID-19 and for the community. Uh, it's obviously very important. Um, so we're, we're really glad you could join and share these, the, your perspective, your resources with us, it's fantastic. Um, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to, to our next uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Alicia Halliday from the Autism Science Foundation. And uh, Dr. Halliday has more information to share about their work and what they've been doing in the COVID-19 situation. Hi, everybody. Yes, thank you. Um, we have been uh, trying during COVID to really ensure that scientists can continue to do their jobs when it comes to understanding families with autism. So. Um, families, our lives were disrupted and so were scientists' lives. And so we wanted to, we want to continue to make sure that, that they can continue their scientific research and the questions they were originally asking. And then we were also funding, re providing resources to fund studies that is specifically looking at the effects of the pandemic on families. And that can, we're, we're funding everything from telehealth to understanding um, medical, I'm sorry, psychiatric comorbidities, and resilience um, in, in this particular difficult situation. Um, we also have a number of COVID-19 resources. Um, we were one of many organizations that um, helped coordinate webinars for information. And we did so collaboratively. We did so with a Autism Speaks, we did so with ASA, um, and we've also done some with the Children's Specialized Hospital of New Jersey. So we know you're being inundated with different webinar opportunities and different remote learning opportunities. And so we're trying to identify what questions haven't been asked yet and what questions um, certainly need to, to, to be answered. Um, if there is, are any scientists out there, our last, um, maybe last, we haven't really decided yet, COVID-19 research grant opportunity um, is ending in mid-July. You still have the, you still have time to go out and um, think of the, the application process is not too bad. It's only a few pages. Um, so if you if you have an idea to look at the effects of the pandemic and social distancing on um, families with autism, or that that could be in families with autism, or it could be using any other methodology, including animal models or um, other sorts of, of um, protocols, we are open to it all. Um, and we also realize that all science has been stalled because of the pandemic. So this next round of um, pre and postdocs that we'll announce soon will not be having a special target area. We, we want everybody to apply because we know that everyone across science is, has, has been hurt as well. Um, so, um, the other thing that we have been trying to do is disseminate information about um, vaccine availability and vaccine resources. So um, that includes webinars. Um, it has um, included partnering with different organizations to make sure those materials are out there. Um, I want to state um, I, I got the vaccine early on. Um, it's a lot easier now. So I think when we hear things about I, you know, I don't want my child, my child can't wait online. Um, we can't wait. Um, they can't be around a whole lot of people. They can't um, be in, in um, outside of their routine. You know, all of these things that were probably pretty onerous when the vaccine was first being distributed and there were not enough vaccines, I think um, have been resolved now. So I know that we're moving into a, a part of, of this whole, this pandemic where at first it was, you know, you were scrambling to get one and now people are making it more uh, available. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't expect long lines and I wouldn't expect a lot of waiting. Um, so people could, could definitely do that. And I'm also seeing more and more in, the, in our communities that, um, you know, uh, that, 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 that masking is now voluntary if you've, if you've been vaccinated. So 
the hope is, is that as many people can get vaccinated as possible so we can all get back to all not wearing masks. Um, or at least those that don't work in healthcare settings or food industry don't have to wear masks. So, um, you know, the, the benefit of getting a vaccine is that you can, you can ditch the mask and start traveling again. So um, I'm going to hand it over to the next speaker now. Yeah, so Alicia, thanks a lot. That's really great. I, I love your point too about the fact that as accessibility increases, some of the barriers, not all of them, of course, but some of the barriers are getting a bit better too. So it's another uh, a positive of what's happened more recently. Um, we're going to move on now uh, to the Q&A portion. And uh, so uh, we'll start off uh, and we'll cycle through the different speakers and people that have particular expertise, depending on, upon the question. But uh, since we're very lucky and blessed to have Dr. Jurgen also up with us, let's start there. Um, uh, our first question is, what do we know about the safety of the vaccines in children? This is generally speaking. Okay. Let me just start by saying that COVID vaccines have been found to be safe and effective in adolescents 12 years of age and older. They're still being tested in younger children. I know that there are questions about when the vaccine will be available. Um, there are hopes that, they, that the vaccines would be available before school starts this fall, but we don't know the timing of that. We've had a lot of questions about um, whether children are less affected by COVID-19 and therefore whether we can wait. Uh, and I think that we saw that with some of the hesitancy data that were presented where parents were saying, if more children get the vaccine or if it's required in school, that then they might vaccinate their children. Uh, but let's be clear, while children have been less affected by COVID-19 compared with adults, children can be infected with the virus um, that causes COVID-19, and some children develop severe illness, and some children have even died. So the question about which children would be more affected is one where we've gotten a lot of questions. So children with underlying medical conditions are at increased risk for severe illness compared to children without underlying medical conditions. It's important to keep that in mind, but current evidence on which underlying medical conditions in children uh, are associated with increased risk are limited. So we have very little data about which conditions, uh, but current evidence suggests that children with medical complexity those with genetic neurologic metabolic conditions or those with congenital heart disease can be at increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19. Similar to adults, children with obesity, diabetes, asthma or chronic lung disease, as well as sickle cell disease or immunosuppression can also be at increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19. So the bottom line is one way to protect the health of children is to ensure that all adults in a household are fully vaccinated against COVID-19. CDC recommends again that everyone ages 12 and older get vaccinated as soon as possible to help protect against COVID-19 and the related potentially severe complications that can occur. One more footnote is I just read today that the Delta variant accounts for 26.1% of US COVID-19 cases. And the variant has been found in every state in the country. Messenger RNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna are effective against the variant. Again, my final pitch is please, if you're 12 and older, <laughs> get vaccinated for the multiple reasons that I have just given. Thank you, that's really great information. I know we have a, a bit of a follow-up to that as well. Uh, I wanna uh, introduce, uh, introduce one of our uh, data scientists at Autism Speaks, BJ Vasudevan, who's gonna uh, follow up, I believe. BJ, you might have some follow-up comments to what you're gonna also just provide. 
Yeah, I wanted to actually add on that everything, um, agree with everything that Dr. Jurgen also uh, said, and also add that if people are interested in that the, um, that there, the clinical trials are still going on for younger children under, um, for kids younger than 12. So if you are interested um, to look out for those clinical trials and Dr. Karen Remley did present to the IAC board on April 28th about the various stages that the different vaccines are at. And I can put in the share with everybody where these different clinical um, trials are at and um, just look up where they are. So if you are interested, you could potentially participate in the clinical trials and maybe get the vaccine now or at the end of the clinical trials. Great, thanks Vijay. And I believe Alicia was gonna jump in on this as well. Sorry, I'm not sure I have anything more more informational to add, but I did want to add that the vaccine trials in kids right now for the COVID vaccine aren't being done in just kids with autism. So they're being done in kids with autism, anxiety, physical disabilities, um, you know, kids in wheelchairs, kids with other motor problems. They've been doing across the board, kids who are, for other lack of a better word, other typically developing. So, um, so there, I, I don't know if the question was more, you know, is there a study that is just looking at those with autism compared to those without autism? The answer is no, um, but I would encourage people to go and I put a link um, and I'll, I'll add a link to the chat so it can be shared. There's a website called Coronavirus Protection Network because if the interest was to participate in a clinical trial, I tried to do this with my kids. Um, and they're very, they're very uh, specific about your, where you live. You have to live in a certain location, that's okay. Um, but if you're interested in participating in a clinical trial um, in, in children, you can go to this website and they have um, information about which studies are being conducted um, and where they're being conducted and, and, and how and if you can get involved. Great, thanks Alicia. Um, I'd like to go back to Dr. Jurgen Alsup for a second here. We have a follow-up question. Uh, I know that you had, in the last question, you gave us a lot of great info about the safety of vaccines in children more generally. This one is a little more specific. What do we know about the vaccine in adults and children with disabilities and chronic underlying conditions? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So in the clinical trials, there were individuals with a number of the underlying medical conditions. And at CDC, we are currently looking at some of those specific conditions. So we can't say uh, which of the conditions put individuals more at risk. We can say that we realize from the data that there were a number of conditions um, as, a, as a group that did increase uh, the risk of developing COVID-19. So we will have further information uh, on the specific conditions and I know people are very interested, uh, but I can put a link in the chat where this information is available on the CDC website with a list of the chronic underlying conditions that increase the risk of, um, of COVID-19. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question, a uh, little bit uh, different area here. Have there been side effects specifically for people with autism? Uh, any, I, any, uh, any of the panel can take this one. I don't know if anybody wants to jump in. So I'll take this one. So there actually uh, doesn't seem to be any more or less um, side effects than there are in anyone else in people with autism. So the typical side effects, the most common one is a sore arm. Um, 
And then some people have reported um, feeling sick for about a day. Some people, that's actually a small percentage, believe it or not. I know you're hearing all these terrible stories about, about these terrible side effects from the vaccine for knocking people out for three days. They're actually, when you look at the numbers, pretty rare, but some people do have them. Um, there doesn't seem to be any particular um, uh, you know, change in those side effects across different conditions so far. Um, but if you compare, this is the thing, if you compare um, the, the, the risk of getting you know, a, a sore arm, which by the way, I got, I know, versus having to spend weeks in the hospital on a ventilator, um, certainly you're talking about less discomfort with getting the vaccine. Great, thanks, Alicia. Are there any, anyone else on that? We do have a couple of other questions here. Um, uh, are there pros and cons of the mRNA versus the J and J vaccine for the autism community? Uh, the comment here is: I can see a single jab experience being a little easier than multiple shots. Are there any other scientific pros or cons? I answered that one, but I'll I'll, I'll uh, on the chat. I'm sorry. I probably should should wait for it, but. Um, uh, the J and J vaccine uses a different kind of um, pathway than the other two, um, and hasn't been studied in terms of longer term outcomes as well as the Pfizer and the Moderna. Um, however, uh, you know it also it also is shown to be a little bit less effective. But all of the scientists and all the the public health experts are saying get whatever vaccine you can. If you can only get J and J get J and J. If you can only get Pfizer, get Pfizer. Again, right now, it's not like you have to drive an hour and a half twice to get back and forth to get a vaccine. You can probably get the vaccine pretty close to your house or where you live or even on a bus or a train route. So um, you have that flexibility now to, you know, to get whatever vaccine you want. I do understand that for some people, and I'm seeing this over and over again in the questions, a lot of people saying that their, their, their child or their adult child, they'll still always be your child, no matter how old they are, but your adult person that lives with you um, it, it, it hates shots. And um, I completely get that. So if the J&J &J works better for you and you feel like that's going to be a better option because you don't think you're going to be able to get your child or your adult child to the doctor's office twice to go through this, then the J&J &J may be the one to go for. But I also know that um, uh, it is a little bit less, uh, less effective. Um, and also it's really not as, you know, I, I understand, I, I completely understand the fear of shots. Um, but the whole process really isn't as, as bad. There is a small percentage that have an adverse reaction, but certainly you want to explain what's going to happen. Um, and uh, hopefully they've gotten vaccines before and they know what to expect. And then you just keep an eye out for any, you know, prolonged response like fever or, you know, even a little bit of coughing after the vaccine. Sorry. And I'd like to um, add that, um, yes, the efficacy was, I think, 90% or so with the J&J &J and 94 to 95% with uh, Pfizer and Moderna. And um, I know that we're very focused on COVID vaccine right now, but the um, effectiveness of flu vaccine is only about 40%. So again, um, the vaccine offers um, a lot of um, protection and it is even believed, although we don't know for sure, that um, the protection may last for um, a longer period of time than for example, the flu vaccine. So I think it's important to keep that um, in mind when we are talking about reluctance and hesitancy to get the COVID um, vaccine. Uh, about the side effects and getting the shot, I for one did not even feel the needle going in. Um, this may be um, unique to particular individuals, um, but I do know that there are scientists working on 
how to reduce the impact of the needle going in. And we have done that uh, with um, other um, shots for, for children. So if that's an issue, I think that we will be able to address the concern about the discomfort with getting a shot. <laughs> That's great information. I, um, I'm going to turn a little bit away from, uh, from, from that sort of technical side to uh, a question about how we communicate this. So uh, maybe I'll start with Ariana Esposito on this one. The question is, for people supporting someone who is non-speaking, how do I communicate with them about their feelings about the vaccine and or just assist them with getting the vaccine while honoring their autonomy? And then there's a follow-up that says sort of how do I find someone where the staff would be understanding of this situation for this non-speaking individual? Sure. Those are all great. Those are all great questions. First, I would recommend you know you communicating in the the way that your loved one with autism normally communicates. So just because they're non-speaking, um, whether it's writing things down or using an alternative communication device or other communication methods is definitely the place to start. Our toolkit um, does have a, like a planning part. So the social story um, can be read to, and then it sort of helps develop the plan and you can interact um, and ask questions and that preferred communication method to build the plan. I think what's really great about that vaccine card, that not the vaccine card, but the um, supports card that we have as part of the toolkit is you can write that down ahead of time. So even if you're not going to, you know, a vaccine site that the staff went through, you know, the training that I spoke about earlier, that vaccine card is universal. You know, that that support card is really universal, and you could bring it to your local pharmacy or you know the, another vaccine site that you may be getting. Um, the vaccine. I think another tip too is if you have any additional support team that's alongside um, with your loved one, also working with, um, you know, determining what might be um, a good, how often to plan, you know, how much to plan and what specifically, you know, the steps to help develop. Um, and when you're at the site, you know, if you're, um, if you're accompanying your loved one, you know, part of the questions you can ask is, you know, where do you want to be, where does, where do they want you to be involved in the process and honor that throughout the, throughout the vaccine um, experience. Yeah, and since I've got you, Ariana, we've got another question that's kind of in, in the ballpark here. Um, one of the, uh, the question uh, is about whether or not if you have a child who is afraid of needles or has anxiety around medical visits, mm -hmm. Um, or just struggles with, you know, the medical situation in general, uh, and obviously is anticipating a struggle with the vaccine, what, what would you suggest there? Are there any resources or tools that people can access or just uh, recommendations? Of course. So on um, our website, we have a number of toolkits specific to medical appointments. Um, that's a great place to start in addition to our, our toolkit. Depending on the makeup of your support team, that would be something to develop um, a plan around, you know, you know whether um, it's working with a behavior specialist or um, any other um, specialist that may be on your team to help begin that process. And also working with um, your the medical team as well, your doctors and physicians um, about um, ways to prep ahead of time that could be helpful. But I do think um, we do have a number of toolkits on our um, website that do talk about preparing for medical appointments. That would be really helpful. Great. And I see we've gotten some questions about specific health conditions that people are concerned, maybe whether or not their child would, would should take uh, the vaccine. I, uh, and we got an answer there from Dr. Jurgen Alsop, who said, uh, you can discuss your child's medical history with your healthcare provider to determine if they should receive the vaccine. So for folks who may have children with a specific genetic syndrome or a particular condition, obviously it never hurts to, and in this case, it would be really useful to go and talk with your healthcare provider that knows your child, knows their medical history, and then can uh, make an, uh, a recommendation for you. Um, and Chris, I think you wanted to offer an answer for parents there as well. Yes, thanks, Tom. I, I just, Dr. Fraser, thank you. Uh, in addition to the resources that you 
just heard about from Autism Speaks, and I think that those toolkits are real helpful. I would encourage parents who were looking for support to seek out the Autism Society in their area and their community to find out, you know, what facilities have they brought their children to that found them to be welcoming and comforting like um, Angela described in her Northern Virginia experience and, and others have, as well as um, assistance uh, with from parents and other caregivers about how do we communicate, how do we effectively and appropriately uh, interact and engage individuals on the spectrum who may not have those abilities to be verbal but use other communicative devices, right? Um, we know that parents and caregivers are instrumental to helping us understand how to better serve care and love for them. So I, I just would offer that, you know, reach out to the, if you come to the Autism Society's website, seek out the affiliate that's closest to the area you live in, we may be able to put you in touch with some parents, caregivers, and or support groups um, that can help you with this uh, challenge. Great, great. And um, Dr. Jurgen, also, if I hate to keep leaning on you, but this one is right in your ballpark. So um, is the CDC or other groups that you're aware of uh, federally or non-federally studying the effects of children's development on the, uh, in the vaccine? Any plans for long-term studies of the vaccine just to understand its, uh, its relationship to child development? I think you're muted uh, really quickly, sorry. Sorry. Um, I don't know about all the research that's being undertaken. I did hear about a study that is looking at pregnant women um, to understand the um, effects of the uh, vaccine during pregnancy. And that study is going to follow children, I think to one year of age. Uh, which is not very old, but I do think that that will give us some information about the safety of the vaccines during pregnancy and some idea of the at least short term effects uh, in terms of development, growth and development and medical conditions in those children. Great, that's great, yeah. And I imagine, and, and this is, I don't have specific information here, but I imagine people will want to study um, this over time. I think right now the effort is so much on vaccination that probably aren't, um, you know, necessarily um, initiating and advertising long-term studies at this point. But I think obviously this is going to be, it's top of mind for so many people. Uh, I think we'll be studying this scientifically for a long, long time, most likely. And I, I'd like to add that one of the um, difficulties with understanding, uh, at least uh, in terms of disability in, in children and the impact of not just COVID, but the impact of the vaccines is the fact that we don't have a consistent definition of disability. Um, and we are working with our colleagues at the National um, Center for Health Statistics to understand or at least to come up with a standard definition so that even the existing surveys and studies that we have, we're not always able to compare the results or understand um, using common language exactly what the outcomes are in children. So I just wanted to put a plug for adding um, disability to existing studies and having consistent definitions. So many of the questions that are being asked, we really don't have the information. And part of that is because the data just aren't available. But the pandemic and this experience has also shown us that we need to do more in this area and we need to have definitions that allow us to understand the impact of the disease as well as the impact of the vaccines on our populations of concern. Great point, great point. I think you know having a consistent definition allows us to do really rigorous work. So that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, we're gonna wrap up now. I, I obviously wanna thank everyone for attending. I wanna thank our panelists. You guys are fantastic. Uh, I think uh, 
also want to mention, you know, just a huge thank you to our partners who've joined us today, the Autism Science Foundation, the Autism Society of America, the CDC. Um, you know, putting us all together, I think, gives people one place that they can go for lots of great information. So I hope you've done that today. And please do follow everyone on social for more resources as the pandemic evolves. Obviously, we're all working to create more tools and supports for the community. So please check these uh, uh, Twitter and Facebook pages out. Um, and I'll just end by saying thank you very much. I hope you've gotten something out of this and uh, are able to better understand vaccine accessibility. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot.